The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. The fact of the matter is, in the history of both terrorism broadly and in the history of jihadist terrorism more specifically, 9-11 is an outlier. 9-11 is the thing that kind of gets accomplished once and then is extremely hard to regenerate. Look at, you know, you mentioned Omar Farouk Abdul-Muttalib and the December 2009 bombing attempt. Let's say that succeeded. 300 people would be dead. That is still as disgusting an atrocity as that was, something that tells us something about the extant state of Al-Qaeda's both operations and capability in 2009. And if you want to attribute some of that to the war on terror itself, go ahead, I'll bake that in. But there's no Islamic state in 2009. There's no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before the invasion of Iraq. There is no ability for such a thing to generate absent what America does. I'm Ian Enright, and this is The Lawfare Podcast, August 31st, 2021. Jack Goldsmith sat down with national security reporter Spencer Ackerman. He's the author of the new book, Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump. The two discussed the book and the consequences of 20 years of the war on terror. With the recent developments in Afghanistan, the conversation touches on the complicated history of the United States and the Middle East, a conflict that has now spanned four presidencies. Ackerman raises, among other things, that there's a direct line between America's response to 9-11 and the rise of political figures like Donald Trump. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 31st, Reign of Terror with Spencer Ackerman. Spencer, a central claim in your book is that the American response to 9-11 brought us Donald Trump and the Trump presidency. Explain how that works. So uh, it works on a couple different levels. Some of that is political. Some of that is institutional. Uh, So let's take the political one first. The war on terror doesn't invent anything. What it is, is a mechanism, a door, if you will, opened to the most noxious, nativist, racist, and violent aspects of American history. And it gives them justification to reassert power during a time of national emergency and a broad political atmosphere, broad in the sense of being broadly shared amongst elites, not just in both parties, but Uh, within journalism, within the security state, amongst intellectuals, and so on, that righteous patriotic vengeance is the appropriate response to 9-11. And once that happens, as you you can see throughout history, not only American history, but certainly American history, empowered nativism does not stay within prescribed boundaries. American Muslims found themselves very quickly within a crucible in the United States. Immigrants found themselves very quickly within a crucible in the United States. I recently had occasion to look back through some accounts taken by Muslim community leaders in a neighborhood near where I live in Brooklyn known as Little Pakistan, in which I saw um, and reflected upon children, 13, 14, 15, telling some of their community leaders about the ways in which they were dehumanized, the ways in which they were threatened, that they were called Osama, that white classmates talked about uh, telling immigration authorities on them, uh, telling them that they were responsible for 9-11. There was a broad intellectual, I would say probably more journalistic declaration 
of national unity after 9-11 that entirely left such people out precisely so that it could be legitimate to target them, to scapegoat them, to take away their freedom, to deport them, to keep them under a general atmosphere of suspicion. And when you go back and you see some of the architects of this, you see very familiar figures that would go on to prominence in the Trump administration. One of the architects of the immigration crackdowns that were functional tools for the Justice Department to, shall we say, invite Muslims in America to prove their loyalty and earn a path to citizenship, earn, by informing on their neighbors. That operated under the broad, and I think it's really plain to see racist, presumption that American Muslim communities were incubating further acts of terrorism. That was a policy, a series of policies, the roundups in particular, extended detentions in places like the Metropolitan Correction Center in Brooklyn Sunset Park uh, by John Ashcroft, the attorney general at the Times, immigration advisor, Chris Kobach, who would go on to be a prominent member of Donald Trump's short-lived uh, commission on voter suppression advertising itself as a commission investigating voter fraud. Um, and there are many such examples of this. Uh, many of the architects and custodians of the war on terror ended up serving in the Trump administration. John Kelly is a, a particular example. The justifiers of the war on terror do. Jeff Sessions is a great example. Many of the people who argue for eviscerating the Fourth Amendment in the name of broad counterterrorism surveillance Someone like that was Bill Barr, who is the, the former uh, attorney general who, uh, at the start of the war on terror, is Verizon's general counsel, which is a crucial relationship, ultimately, uh, for the NSA, and then becomes Donald Trump's attorney general and engineers the crackdown, or rather has the joint terrorism task forces, these federal and local law enforcement partnerships, look for anti-fascist demonstrators to treat uh, as terrorists and use the tools of terrorism against them. We saw that on the streets of American cities like Portland, where DHS was stuffing protesters into vans and treating protesters shooting off fireworks at a courthouse in the name of Black liberation as essentially people firing IEDs and treating them accordingly. And then on an institutional level, uh, we see how the architecture of uh, American institutions that are supposed to pose as guardrails against authoritarian possibilities in the Justice Department, in the courts, uh, in the intelligence services, instead acquiesce uh, to the war on terror and through degree and very often through bureaucratic decision making, end up eroding those guards until it becomes justified by consensus to have things like an indiscriminate panopticon surveillance program that ends up collecting all Americans' domestic call records, that collects en masse Americans' communications records with overseas communicants and so on and so forth. And through degree, through inertia, after the initial decision to enact programs like these that are just absolutely lawless, ultimately, uh, the acquiescence continues through inertia. and. All of this occurs. I mean, we haven't even talked about, you know, other things, the transformation of immigration from a process of creating more Americans into one that exists within a counterterrorism context. Can I, can I just interject here? So I understand all that, but that strikes me as more of a story. That strikes me more of your story about continuity, that this thing started in 9-11 and it built and there's a continuous relationship up through Trump. But I thought the claim was that the response to 9-11 is what invited and gave an opening to Trump, that Trump took advantage of that response and that's why he was president. Is that not the claim? Well, the, there's, an, there's another element to that, which is that as the war goes on, its disaster becomes sort of less and less easy to explain away. And through the process of explaining away, we also see, you know, particularly through the Bush and then the Obama years, this apparatus of gigantic manipulation of the public into saying that torture isn't torture. It's something called enhanced interrogation, that surveillance is targeted. It's not indiscriminate, that drone strikes 
are targeted killings rather than executions of people whom the CIA doesn't necessarily have to know who, in fact, they, they are. And as these wars become more agonizing and certainly stretch away from any conclusion, the agony of a kind of cognitive dissonance in American exceptionalism sets in, that people who are treated as functionally subhuman, the people against whom the war on terror operates, are somehow winning in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. And an element starting on the right can't really wrap their heads around this condition, given that America is supposed to be omnipotent and set the terms for uh, the rest of the world. And then Trump comes in and has an explanation for this, which is that the war on terror is insufficiently focused civilizationally, and it's insufficiently brutal against so many people. And the reasons that he offers for this are to point at the elites who've kept this going, that haven't concluded it, and also say things like this isn't a war on Islam. Trump is able to explain this very well. And then when he gets in power, the erosion of all of these institutional constraints, as well as the very broad in the war on terror culture of shall we say, patriotic unreality, if we don't like the phrase big lies, allows him to govern um, and tests the limits of what remains of democratic constraints. And, And my contention is that the war on terror is in many, many ways a continuity of the noxious elements, in my perspective, of American history that provides a new opportunity for those elements to take power. So it's it's not quite as binary as, as, yeah. as you phrased it. Right. So I agree with you that Trump came in and was more bellicose and was had a much higher valence of brutal rhetoric. I mean, he took what you called the, the polite facade of war off and emphasized the opposite. And he ramped up, especially early on and in many other respects, the war. But But there's another side to it, and you touch on it a little bit, but I think there's more to it than you say. So let me make the case that you criticized Donald Trump the dove, the idea of Donald Trump the dove, and he certainly wasn't a dove. But I think he was a more important figure in transitioning towards, I don't want to call it a wind down of the war on terrorism, but I think he moved it in another direction. I mean, he did, I think, during the campaign, his anti-war rhetoric, whatever its motivation, mainstream that idea in the Republican Party, or at least elevated it. He did win the nomination by attacking people like the Bushes and the McCains. In office, he clashed with the national security bureaucracy and with the military about drawing down troops in Afghanistan and Syria, even though he lost a lot of those battles. By the end of his presidency, he claimed, I think with justification, that, quote, unlike previous administrations, I have kept America out of new wars and our troops are coming home. And there were fewer troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think, at the end of his presidency than in any time since 2001 and 2003, respectively. And even you say in your book that the most valorous act of his disgraceful presidency was the accord with the Taliban to this withdrawal and peace process. So isn't he a complicated figure on, on this front? Everything that you say is a fact, but I disagree in pretty much every respect of your interpretation of it. Okay, great. Um, When when you say that his anti-war rhetoric found a place within the Republican Party, it absolutely did. The trouble is, is look at what that rhetoric is now. That rhetoric now is talking about a surrender to the Taliban and the civilizational danger to America of letting in Afghan refugees, both those who actively aided the American war effort and Western interests there and those who didn't. So that, I think, speaks more to the enduring legacy of Trump as someone who was willing to use anti-war rhetoric when it suited his quest for power. It's also true that the national security bureaucracy lines up against Trump, except for all of the cases when it doesn't, as with the Department of Homeland Security and its aggressive prosecution of interior immigration enforcement, locking people up and putting them in inhuman conditions. And also, you know, so many of the so-called lions of the war on terror, as I often call them in the book, the adults in the room, from H.R. McMaster to Jim Mattis in particular, these were people who were very willing to use Trump as a vehicle and acquiesce to those aspects of his policies that that they found tolerable. Mattis, in particular, stood over Trump's shoulder and applauded at the Pentagon 
when he signed the Muslim ban, someone who I think represented for a lot of respectable upper middle class liberals and elite Democrats and never Trump Republicans as a supposed bulwark against Trump. And it's very selective when they, in fact, do that. The national security bureaucracy acquiesces to Trump over quite a lot or finds that there are more areas of commonality than they are areas of departure over things like, as you can see from uh, the reports that the ODNI publishes, how expansive surveillance continues on a glide path throughout the Trump years. You say that he kept America out of new wars. He said that. Okay, sorry. He says he, he uh, keeps America out of new wars, but he not only escalates the wars that he inherits in Afghanistan, especially before he realizes that there's no other option but to sue for peace with the Taliban. But remember, this person also sent 14,000 troops around the Middle East, and particularly uh, the Gulf states, to keep on a kind of accelerated uh, war posture with Iran, and then assassinated Qasem Soleimani, risking, really very badly, risking a calamitous uh, new war uh, with Iran. And it was really more Iranian restraint than anything the United States did. And then finally, you know, there is an unfortunate tendency in elite national security circles to view acts like bombing a country as an alternative to war rather than on a continuum with war. And, you know, when Trump ultimately attacks uh, Syria without any sort of congressional authorization, but instead to applause from, you know, not just, you know, the famous example of, um, Brian, what's his name on MSNBC, who says, like, when the bombs drop, you know, this is the day Trump becomes president. You, you really see the ways in which when Trump's rhetoric contradicts Trump's reality, the common perception is to go with the rhetoric and view that as the important thing rather than the actions that Trump takes. So I acknowledge all that. And I, I said at the top, he wasn't a dove. He, in some senses, ramped up the war. But there is a puzzle. I mean, we need to explain why, you know, he committed this valorous act of the most valorous act of his disgraceful presidency. Who knows how engaged Trump was on any of this stuff, because he was kind of a it was kind of a random walk through his presidency. But we know it sometimes he did clash with his military and trying to wind things down on some dimensions, not all. I agree. And that they had been troop drawdowns and there were was this valorous act, as you describe it. So. What accounts for it? Two things account for it. One, Trump, like a very good politician and like a politician who is unburdened by trying to please uh, the general consensus in favor of the war on terror in both parties, that there is no popular demand for the wars themselves. There is lots of very cultivated popular demand, particularly on the right for extreme reactions, violent reactions, repressive reactions to non-white people and their perceived allies. Trump recognizes that that's the ore to mine inside the war on terror, rather than, as a lot of Trump's elite enemies focus on, the kind of carbonized husk of these failed wars. And the second element of that is Trump recognizes that a threat to his power comes from within the security agencies that are at least nominally independent of the presidency and seeks instead to suborn them. And this he accomplishes through a series of purges. This he accomplishes through an intensification of politicized pressure on them, the arrival of apparatchiks, whether it's Sessions in his crew, uh, whether it's Barr in his crew, whether it's real clowns inside uh, Liberty Crossing, like Rick Grinnell and uh, John Ratcliffe. Trump ultimately uses the rhetoric of a deep state, which is not really something that I think we, we have in America in the way that exists in Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, and so forth. But one of the reasons that the United States doesn't have that and has something else that I call the security state, a kind of federated collection of security tribes with their own interests, sort of associated with elites in, in kind of both parties and, and essentially the major constituency, um, in this case, for the war on terror. But the way a deep state manifests and can manifest and can incubate 
is through the erosion of the rule of law that we have certainly seen accelerate throughout the 9-11 era and on personal allegiance to a political figure. In this case, Trump wasn't fighting a deep state. Trump was constructing one. And we ought to really grapple with the implications of all of that. But I just, just last to point on this, and I don't mean to press it too much, but it seems a curiosity that Trump did something this, you know, he was on a path to pulling us out of Afghanistan that Obama couldn't pull off. And I'm not defending or trying to glorify Trump. I'm just trying to understand. It seems to me that his case and his attitude towards the endless war, I buy many of your criticisms about how he ramped things up and deepened the problems. But on other dimensions, paradoxically, you know, he did set us on the path to what's going on now in Afghanistan, and we'll get there in a second. Uh, it just seems it just seems that we don't have a complete theory of how that happened. I mean, I think my book offers one. Um, you just may not find it compelling. Well, I think that it is. one more time. The, the theory once more is that Trump is a lagging indicator of the war on terror, that he's a lagging indicator of the war on terror as it fails and accordingly will manage aspects of the war on terror in increasingly violent uh, but not necessarily coherent ways, because he recognizes the overseas wars are the expendable thing about that. So what does Trump do before he sues for peace uh, with the Taliban? He escalates the Afghanistan war, functionally doubles the troop presence in Afghanistan in 2017 in a kind of amazing speech where, as he announces it, he kind of recognizes uh, at several points in the speech that like it may not in fact yield anything. And in particular, it won't necessarily, because it didn't, yield the thing that people like H.R. McMaster and Jim Mattis were arguing that a mini surge in Afghanistan would, which is to say you hit the Taliban so hard that they will sue for peace and negotiate. Instead, you know, Trump does that. He drops the largest non-nuclear bomb in the American arsenal on Afghanistan, he basically does what he says he's going to do on the campaign trail and bomb the shit out of people. That ultimately is what he does in Afghanistan. He um, also releases the military from a lot of restrictions, tactically speaking, to accelerate bombing. And then by one estimate in 2019, civilian deaths in Afghanistan increased by 330%. It is only after all of that happens and yields nothing that Trump really through, you know, the, the work of a really active and engaged diplomat. I have my criticisms about, of, of him, but Zalmay Khalilzad ultimately recognizing that the Taliban are a fact, all else has failed. The Taliban will remain a fact in Afghanistan. And unless there is some deal with the Taliban for withdrawal, or the United States is just deciding that it will control Afghanistan indefinitely. There is no choice but to negotiate an end to the war. And I, I, I kind of just don't find this as puzzling as you seem to. Yeah. So then it's not valorous. He had to do it. But nevertheless, he did. All of the previous presidents before Trump don't. Obama not just tries, but almost comically fails uh, by negotiating with an imposter. It is still the case that Trump decided to take the step of open negotiation with the Taliban that the Trumps of that era during the Obama administration, certainly Trump himself, yeah. would have immediately um, lambasted Obama for doing, would have lambasted Bush for doing. We're seeing the proof of that in that Trump right now is calling the Taliban uh, victorious and Biden having surrendered to it. Ultimately, Trump was the lesson that the wars themselves are no more than just political cudgels to win political power back at home. Trump, like everyone said during, um, you know, the start of his administration, you know, Trump does the quiet part loud. Trump is the subtext of the war on terror. And that's why the text is so fungible. Only as long as the subtext, that civilizational violence, that retribution under guise of patriotic righteousness, as long as that remains, the rest of it, you can do with it as you like. Scale the wars up, scale the wars down. Say you're there to take the oil, try and take the oil. That stuff is all things that can be used as necessary for the broader purpose of accruing power at the expense of vulnerable people. Okay, so let's turn to Obama. You know, you describe how he was a pretty profound anti-war candidate. He gave a speech that you discuss 
early in his presidency where he said that perpetual war would prove self-defeating and alter our country in troubling ways. You respond to that by saying a great tragedy of the Obama presidency is that this insight did not guide his actions. And the question is, why? Why did Obama not follow through on what I believe were kind of deeply held commitments? But you might, I think in parts of the book, you you question that. Obama isn't the omnibus anti-war figure that I think people both hoped he was or feared he was. And he, he said back. that on the campaign trail, as you note. I mean, he said he was against Iraq, but he he did quietly say we're going to have to keep doing stuff in Afghanistan. And so I just wanted to make that point. I, I covered all this at the time and tried to write that yeah. Um, yeah. at the yeah. time, that right. that this was a very nuanced position, which I think is probably a deeper uh, commitment of Obama's than uh, any anti-war position. Obama you know, loves subtlety, he loves complexity, and he loves substituting, I believe, moral rigor with bureaucratic rigor. And we see that throughout his presidency. You know, when he gives his famous, um, as a state senator, 2002 speech about dumb wars, the only dumb war he identifies is the Iraq war. And his argument throughout 2008 and also was kind of the argument that after 2004, the Democratic Party sort of wished it had and wished it had as, a, as an option to it, which is that the problem with the Iraq war is that it is a distraction from the real war on terror, which has to be fought. And Obama governs accordingly. I mean, but as Ben Rhodes put it, and you quote Ben Rhodes, you know, he governed accordingly because he thought that there was a real threat there. Do you think that's wrong? Well, that isn't actually what Ben says. Well. At one point, Ben does say that, but at another point in the book, when I ask him why he didn't, why Obama didn't end the war after killing Osama bin Laden, I think there he points, you know, to the realer reason there, which is that, like, let's say that Obama says the war on terror is over and starts dismantling um, the apparatus of it. There's another terrorist attack and the world ends. And what he's trying to express there is something that I believe is very real and was it was a real constraint on Obama, which is that a there's always going to be more terror. B, America's extremely violent, exploitative, and repressive actions in the Muslim world kind of ensure there will be more terror. And then finally, the fact that there will be the prospect of of more terror leads to what we've seen throughout the 9-11 era, which is political fear. That is what Ben is articulating, that the fear that still governed Obama prevented him from exercising leadership, prevented him from doing what at various points in Obama's speeches and in his rhetoric, he recognizes is the right thing to do. This is what happens when Obama gives a speech at the National Defense University in in May of 2013, where he says that an indefinite war will alter our country in profound ways, and then just sort of lets that hang out there and doesn't develop it. Obama had an opportunity for real leadership, profound leadership, and he doesn't take that out of fear. And, and he allows that fear to constrain what, quote unquote, ending these wars actually means and allows him to kind of transition his approach to the war on terrorism in, in, in a way that I kind of call a sustainable one, or at least that's how his rhetoric frames it, even when he doesn't use that word. Uh, itself, which is kind of like viewing the war on terror as an enterprise. You think of it like an aircraft. The aircraft isn't really stable to safely operate at 30,000 feet. But what if it operates at 10,000 feet? What if it becomes less conspicuous at that point? Then probably it's safe to continue these operations indefinitely and figure out, you know, some way, defer um, an opportunity to figure out some way down the line how it ever, you know, actually reaches the ground. But instead, asymptotically, it never actually reaches the ground. And Obama's decisions, not only once kept aloft, allow the option later on for future presidencies, Trump is, is just one of them, we'll probably see more down the line, to escalate it. Yeah, I agree with that part of it. But let me go back and push you on something. So look, you say that Obama was trapped by this fear of another attack, and you suggest several times in the book that it was a failure of political leadership to wind down the war in the face of those fears. 
But I think that's too easy. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned briefly the Detroit underwear near bombing and you don't get into the details, but other books have Charlie Savage's power wars goes into great detail about how, you know, that was at a time when I think you said also they were, they were on a path to at least slow it down. And that was a wake up call to everyone because they realized if that had happened, that it wouldn't just have been bad news for Obama, that his entire domestic agenda would be jeopardized and that the nation would be devastated. And so you make it seem like the, the fear of another attack, and I'm not denying that maybe we have exaggerated fears at all, but it's not just discardable through political leadership. It's real, and presidents have to deal with it. Presidents can deal with it in a variety of ways. The way that you have outlined is one that will always keep this thing going. I agree. As, I don't, well, I think there is a way out of the paradox, and the paradox is acknowledging and arguing for why the war on terror threatens uh, the security of the American people, because it's the war on terror that in direct ways that I trace through the book that creates the Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalibs of the war on terror. If there was no war on terror, well, look, we can never know counterfactuals, but Anwar al is not calling for attacks on the United States until the FBI decides to target Anwar al And ultimately, the war on terror operates as an engine of his radicalization. The fact that there will always be terror attacks is a fact about the world. It is one that the war on terror makes worse, but is one that sends political elites into a kind of apoplexy rather than a recognition that ending the war on terror is a more substantial engine of both preventing those attacks and addressing the material conditions that lead psychotic people to launch them. And as long as Obama accepts the logic that you need to keep this thing going because there is always going to be another attack, then there is no way out of that kind of thinking. Just because there would be demagoguery after something like a successful Detroit bombing does not mean that the political system has to bow to that demagoguery. I think as long, I think that is also a symptom of the ways in which national security and foreign policy remains one of the least democrats in American governance. The public never really wants in any more than a brittle way additional war on terror. You know, to go back to your question about Trump, Trump recognizes the unpopularity of this enterprise. And that is what seems to a lot of people on the right, refreshing that there's no longer this kind of labored position amongst you know, Republican politicians and their media justifiers to defend the war and keep it on this course. He can say outright that this is a disaster, that this isn't something that ultimately uh, can be continued. And at the same time as that's happening, the Obama administration and the security agencies, which have just experienced the seven years after Abdul Muttalib that you reference, in becoming the stewards of the war, as it only gets worse, is ultimately we see the wages of the invasion and occupation of Iraq are the so-called Islamic State. Those elites who are opposed to Trump, particularly on national security, have no answer to his critique because they built this thing. They maintained this thing. They are the constituency for this thing. They are, in many ways, the reason why an Obama would face demagoguery over winding down the wars. And there isn't really a desire, as we can see from, from Ben's answer to me, within the administration for confronting that in a really fulsome way, for even a professorial sort like Obama to give the kind of speech that would be like, yes, I recognize lots of people are screaming about these successful attacks. But let's look at the root causes for why those things happen. And let's look at the consequences of the approach of the last, at that point, I guess we would say nine years of the war on terror. Have they led to better results or have they only led us back to this moment? And that's where I think the kind of answer to your question lies. Yeah. So let me just press you one more time on that. So I sure. set for purpose of argument that and I think that there's truth to this, and I think there's even an emerging consensus on this, that the way that this war has been fought has certainly not succeeded in tamping down threats abroad, and that 
you could make a case that we've enhanced threats, especially if you look to what we did in Iraq. So let's accept all that for purposes of argument. But Obama is stuck in whatever year it was, 2009, I think. And he's on a path that is trying and is making slow progress on some dimensions of narrowing or slowing down the war. And certainly they were very high on the rhetoric of slowing down the war. And then Detroit happens. And, you know, you say that, you know, what? let's say the bombing had happened. It would have been very hard for Obama to at that point say, you know, this is a terrible thing, but we're the ones that caused this. We And we need to not overreact to this because that's just going to make it worse. That sounds good in theory, but it's not realistic. And it's not realistic. You talked about democracy. It's not realistic because he would have been shellacked domestically in terms of the domestic political reaction to that. My point is that accepting that the United States has made lots of mistakes that may have made the the problem worse. Let's just talk about how you end it, because the transition is a dangerous time, and it depends on a counterfactual or it depends on the belief that winding down this war is going to lead to fewer threats on balance. And first of all, it's not clear that that's true. Indeed, I would suggest it's probably not true, even given the cost. But even if it is true, it's very, very hard for presidents to take that risk. I mean, in, in reality, given the politics of it. The thing is, is that your argument is circular, that because the risks exist, then they will always exist. And I, I think that, you know, absent some political force challenging it, that, that is certainly true. I don't mean to diminish that there will always be. I mean, look at what Biden is experiencing right now for pulling out of Afghanistan. The opportunities for demagoguery are, are just too great. And you should operate on the presumption that they will accelerate, particularly as, as things get worse. We have to remember that from the start of the war on terror, the main political figures around George W. Bush, Karl Rove in particular, recognizes that this is an engine of tremendous political opportunity um, that, that allows you to both seize and maintain power. So of course, all the incentives run toward demagoguery. The thing is, is that all of that has a glass jaw. That glass jaw can be shattered if there is, in fact, leadership willing to offer a different view of the case, one that offers that all of this disaster operates on its own inertia, that it generates its enemies, and that if we look towards its maintenance, the wages of it are the Detroit bombing that we're now presuming would have succeeded, even though, you know, in fact, it, it did not, that depends upon seeing the war on terror as the only solution to the circumstance of terror, that American imperial aggression, that American hegemony, particularly in the Middle East, is necessary to stop the war on terror rather than a necessary condition of terror aimed at, at the United States. Yes, it is extremely politically difficult. It is so politically difficult that it deters people like Barack. How good did that work out? Hello, this is John Grills from Creepy. Want to see something scary? Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Brought to you by AMC Networks. Shudder is a premium streaming service that promises its members a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds. All uncut and commercial free. Discover films and series that cover the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door and one of my new favorite movies, Psycho Gorman. Available ad-free, on demand, and through the platforms you're already on. Shudder. So good... It's scary. Sign up at Shudder.com. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. Yep. So again, I understand the argument. It's a powerful argument. My point was not to be circular. My point was to say that there's a transition problem. 
let's imagine that you're right that just shutting down, abolishing the so-called war on terrorism tomorrow is the right thing to do. And that over time, I mean, I, th I think this is, I think it's implausible, but I'll accept it. Over time, that will do more to diminish threats to the United States than our current path. Let's accept that. My point is, there's a transition period, probably a long one, where the politicians are going to have to assume enormous risks and costs that I think are unrealistic. You call it for political leadership, but that kind of begs all the questions about how you do it. And again, I'm accepting the point you made that, and this is depressing to me, I'm accepting the point you made that on this logic, it means we can never stop. And that, that's what I worry about. But I don't see how we get out of this logic. Well, you organize and you force politicians into a binary choice between political power and abolishing the war on terror. I agree. Maybe this is how we can square our, our circle, Jack. As long as the war on terror remains an undemocratic elite enterprise, yeah, it's, it's going to go on probably permanently and will continue to disfigure the United States in profound ways. And the architects and maintenance of the war on terror will continue to be horrified when more and worse Trump's result and not really want to see the continuities of the war on terror leading uh, to this dire circumstance for American democracy. That probably will be the case. You're surely right when you describe elite behavior, because that's exactly how elite behavior toward the war on terror has operated for the past 20 years. But that doesn't have to be our future. That doesn't have to be what we accept of our political leadership, that surely during um, this sort of transition, look, I'm not a politician, I'm a reporter. Um, I'm not an organizer, I'm a reporter. But during such a transition as you, you know, as you point out, increased vulnerabilities present themselves, surely. But it is, I believe, a more accurate analysis to offer to people, to actually respect their intelligence, to respect what they've seen, particularly um, from those people who have both served in the war on terror and, and have sought to endure the war on terror as civilian targets, both home and abroad, that in fact, that along with America's broader hegemonic posture abroad is what brought us to this point, is what brought us to bombs blowing up and so forth. And that is what, look, you're not going to solve every act of terror, obviously. This is a condition that emerges from imbalances of power amongst combatants throughout history. And that's ineradicable. That has to be addressed politically through addressing the causes of such conflicts. The war on terror itself, as crucial as it is, is probably not going to be sufficient. There needs to be um, an abolition of the war on terror as an entrance point to a more fundamental overhaul of American foreign policy um, and so-called national security in the 21st century. If this is something that people organize for, and I believe this is the point you were kind of getting at um, when you looked at Trump's rhetoric earlier in the conversation, that it reflects how ultimately embittering these wars are. Unless it starts from that grassroots perspective, then ultimately it may indeed endure and maintain, and we will continue to live in the world that such political fear considers, you know, in its sophisticated opinion, as a lamentable circumstance that can never be escaped from because it would just be too difficult uh, for any politician to take. And I guess you can resign yourself to that or you can challenge that consensus. So I think a test case is before us, and that is Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan. And my fear is that whatever, whoever's responsible uh, and however much blame Biden gets for what's going on in the process, not with the decision, not trying to assess that issue. My fear is that the consequences of this are going to be so messy that the argument for, see, I told you so, we can't stop doing this, it's going to be a disaster, is going to raise its head and win. Do you agree with that? Is that a worry? How do you assess what's going on in Afghanistan today? It's it, well, those are two very different questions. Yeah. The, the answer, one you tacked answer, on at the end is, yeah, is, okay. is something okay. let's answer the first yeah. question first. So, the first question that is everything that we have been talking about that yes, the opportunity for the demagoguery presents itself. Biden deserves, I believe, a tremendous amount of credit for making an accurate assessment of the futility of the Afghanistan war, 
and for accepting, although he didn't actually act like this in practice, which we can talk about that later, that the United States had committed itself to a accord with the Taliban that had to be respected because that was also a fact and violating that accord would have consequences, very violent ones. And he kind of did violate it. And we are seeing some of that now. You have to remember that this August 31st deadline is a unilaterally imposed one. That was not a deadline negotiated with the Taliban. The deadline negotiated with the Taliban was for full withdrawal by May 1st, that the United States decided to unilaterally abrogate on the theory that the Taliban would just sort of swallow that. And we're, we've sort of discussed that a lot less. Yes, the extant divisions within the, the political parties that existed when the war on terror was born, not only persist, but have been made worse. And the hawkish elements within both parties, but especially um, within uh, the Republican Party, and now you know joined by the MAGA elements that have now suddenly forgot that the, the hymnal under Trump was that this, this war was bad and stupid, um, have aligned out of you know, convenience and cravenness to say that the pullout is the disaster, rather than to recognize that the pullout is less a disaster than a manifestation of the disaster of the 20 years worth of war. There are specific disasters that are rather attributable to the Biden administration beforehand, but not the wholesale pullout. Yes, if it is not challenged, if it is not aggressively defeated, if the political environment remains a glide path to the intensification of wars, then yes, that opportunity will tragically pass. And it now remains to be seen whether the Biden administration will do as some of the president's rhetoric has suggested, which is stop with the Afghanistan war ending, or rather that insight that the Afghanistan war is futile and that the disaster we are seeing unfold is not a disaster of the absence of fighting it, but the wages of having fought it uh, will guide it toward a more wholesale abolition of the war on terror. All of the political incentives always here favor keeping the war on terror in place, if not accelerating it. And how do you like the world that you live in? How do you like as well the democratic erosion that we've seen not just under Trump, but certainly accelerated under Trump? How do we like the transference of the tools of the war on terror, the dehumanizing focus of the war on terror, the expanding list of domestic enemies of the war on terror, the longer this persists, the longer the opportunities for aiming the war on terror at more and more vulnerable people accelerate? How do we like hearing QAnon, for instance, talk about essentially a revenge fantasy that involves taking the enemies of the MAGA movement, basically everyone MAGA means by the term Democrat, which is to say non-white people, leftists, liberals, members of the security state that are not explicitly deferent to Trump and putting them in Guantanamo Bay. This rhetoric doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from 20 years of cultivated war fever that functions as a focus on other people's barbarism that American barbarism must be marshaled to confront. And unless the United States' leaders are pushed by people I believe probably necessarily from the grassroots, we can expect to continue to live in this world. We can expect to continue to see it get worse. If we justify the current circumstances of the war in all its myriad applications, then we should not be surprised when it continues to get worse and it continues to expand away from enemies that the United States can't defeat but toward domestic political opponents that can always be suppressed. So I want to move on to war on terror abolitionism in a second. But let's just imagine, I want to ask you what that means. But, but before we get into the details, what is the mechanism whereby ending the so-called war on terrorism abroad leads to less of this unattractive, to put it mildly, behavior at home? What What is the mechanism whereby that happens? What's the causation? How would you feel if someone killed your family? I, you know how I would feel, but explain the logic. How would you feel if someone tortured your children? 
No, I, I'm asking if we if if the United States went home tomorrow completely, how do domestic politics and the threat of domestic terrorism change? That's what I'm trying to figure out. When you, when you say domestic terrorism, what do you mean? Terrorism on American soil or terrorism by you're, white people? You, I understood one of your themes to be that there's a relationship between the war on terrorism and the rise of nativism and white supremacy and the threat of white. Uh, ah, I see what you mean. So I'm just trying to figure out, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm trying to figure out what the mechanism is towards ending, abolishing the war on terrorism, which I'm not sure what it means. We'll get to that in a second. And these improvements at home that you think can happen. Sure. Um, it's a great question. One impact is that those nativist elements will have less opportunity in terms of the mechanisms of governance to use repressively against their enemies. And then, you know, if, if you mean to say, like, will ending the war on terror and nativism, it certainly won't. You know, nativism is a force throughout American history. We can see it. Have you read um, The End of the Myth by Greg Brandon? No. It's worth reading. Um, it is a history of the United States through the perspective of the frontier, both the frontier as, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, a policy reality in pushing out uh, the settlement of the American West, which is genocidal and violent, and also the frontier in the American mind, which has, of course, been a preoccupation of historians for, you know, certainly since the closing of the West. But I believe ending an emergency that fuels nativism will open up an opportunity to push it back into, you know, it, certainly it's back foot. It ends an opportunity uh, for it to use, as I mentioned, the mechanisms of the war on terror. But, you know, it is a chance to reckon with the way in which that the conceptions of the enemy under the war on terror uh, were a nativist's dream come true. And saying that these were, in fact, not the existential threats to the United States that we have allowed them to operate as that is to say, through our response to them, and that the opportunities that came along with that redounded to nativist benefit. And this doesn't have to be the case. If you mean to say, is there an automaticity to it? No, I just don't think history works that yeah, way. Right. But no. certainly, certainly when you are doing harm, if you continue to do harm, you shouldn't be surprised when more harm results. And stopping doing harm does not fix the harm that's already done or the manifestations of the harm that's already done, but it gives you a starting position to accomplish that rectification, if that makes sense. Yep. But I'm going to push you on this one more time and then keep I'm, going, I'm, man. I'm, I'm, I'll move on to another topic, but I just have two points into that. One, yeah. you're characterizing our counterterrorism efforts abroad as doing harm, but, and I can accept that there's no doubt that we've made huge mistakes and we've invited problems and I accept your, many of your criticisms. But that's not all it is. I mean, there hasn't been a serious attack on the homeland in 20 years. We can't prove why that's so. But and here's where I get back to my transition point. I, one worries that, you know, a, a, another 9-11 or something like that, and I'm not saying it will happen and I don't know the likelihood. But if we are achieving some security benefits by being abroad, then, you know, just abolishing the war on terrorism must make it more likely that we'll have homeland attacks in the short term, even if we can get to this, you know, wonderful long-term better place. And that is not going to have a good effect on nativism in the United States. That's what the was the El Paso Walmart shooting, a serious attack on the homeland. I, I, well, I don't know. Was the tree of life synagogue murder, the greatest act of uh, anti-Semitic violence in American history, I, again, a I'm serious not, attack on the homeland. But that, that doesn't answer my question. My question is- I think it in fact does. What it does is it reframes your question. It reframes your question toward where in fact the greatest threats to the United States exist. The fact of the matter is in the history of both terrorism broadly and in the history of jihadist terrorism more specifically, 9-11 is an outlier. 9-11 is the thing that kind of gets accomplished once and then is extremely hard to regenerate. Look at, you know, you mentioned Omar Farouk Abdul-Muttalib and the December 2009 bombing attempt. Let's say that succeeded. 300 people would be dead, the 300 people aboard that plane, and let's say whomever else had the, the misfortune of being workers out on that, that tarmac and at the airport. And that is still 
as disgusting an atrocity as that was, something that tells us something about the extant state of Al Qaeda's both operations and capability in 2009. And if you want to attribute some of that to the war on terror itself, go ahead. I'll bake that in. But there's no Islamic state in 2009. There's no Al Qaeda in Iraq before the invasion of Iraq. There is no ability for such a thing to generate absent what America does. It's certainly not the case that America is singularly responsible for this. It is also certainly the case that America is a contributing factor to these things being the case. If, if what you're looking for is, me, is for me to say that like there is certainly a prospect uh, for it to get worse before it gets better, yeah. Like America can't, as it loves to do, this is also a point that you know, Greg Grandin makes wonderfully, in, in the end of the myth, this is kind of what, you know, girds the frontier mentality. It is certainly the case that American history is a story of white people believing they can escape from history. And very often history has a kind of different perspective about that. So, yeah, you may expect even after the war on terror is dead, people who had experienced the war on terror's violence, people who experienced the war on terror's displacement, and people who experience the war on terror's humiliation to look for revenge, because that is very often, as we certainly demonstrated after 9-11, what traumatized people do. So, you know, you say that you're willing to accept that it, it, it may get worse before it gets better. This is the last time I'll say this, and I'll give you the last word on this one. But the, the danger is, the worry is, if it gets worse, it won't get better. And I don't know how you can be confident that that's not the mechanism that would happen. I don't know either. I don't know either. But I think there's a serious likelihood. And certainly this is the assessment that presidents have made. Three presidents in a row have come into office and have run on a kind of anti-war, wind down the war rhetoric, which suggests lots of interesting things, and then have not even come close to fully following through in office. And I think it's because they of this worse is going to make better impossible logic. Well, I mean, I think that is an argument for apoplexy. I think that is an argument for accepting the miserable state of the war on terror as it is made by people who will never experience the consequences of the war on terror, who certainly won't experience the repression of the war on terror really until it's too late. And then they will, you know, lament uh, what an awful and singular figure Trump is. I think that you are right in the sense that there is nothing automatic about the transformation of politics to lead to less demagoguery related to terrorism. That's certainly true. That is why an end to the war on terror has to be the result of people forcing their politicians into doing something like that. And I think we can see reasons for hope. You know, it is always going to be an extremely difficult challenge to get Congress to end a war that it has authorized, certainly within the political environment that you, I believe, rather correctly described. But years of dedicated activism have nevertheless brought Congress to the verge of repealing the 2002 authorization to use military force against Iraq. Now, you can say on the one hand, that that is certainly an insufficient action. Or you can say, on the other hand, that that is a promising prelude to perhaps greater and greater rollback and a sign that the war on terror consensus within elite circles, within government circles, within media circles, is in fact brittle and able to be challenged. Um, and then I would also just kind of challenge the way you framed that last part, that three successive presidents um, have come in with, with anti-war rhetoric. Yeah, but does that really tell you anything more than the fact that they feel the need at the moment they seek power that the public doesn't want necessarily to be perpetually at war? Um, it also kind of conceals which wars they're challenging. As we pointed out earlier, Obama is not an omnibus anti-war politician to um, the uh, disappointment of the left and the uh, incomprehensibility of the right. And I think that is also kind of the case that we see. I, that, to me, is the more consistent element 
of the of the story of the last several presidencies. You can certainly not say at all that George W. Bush in any way used anti-war rhetoric except cynically when he recognized that there was a constituency uh, within the Republican Party that was sufficiently contemptuous of anything Bill Clinton did is to extend that uh, into the wars in the Balkans. Bush had no real criticism of the Balkans wars. He had an opportunity that presented itself. And I don't think we should consider those sorts of moments of political expediency to be like real commitments. I think we see real commitments when people govern. So you call in the book for uh, an abolitionist approach to the war on terrorism. And you say, you, you, this the whole book in some sense is making the case, I think, for the abolitionist approach. Because so what exactly is the abolitionist approach? What does that look like? I think we should talk about this in really broad terms. In, and, you know, you will be frustrated with this answer. But I don't believe that one person always ought to come up with an answer for an entire society. I think that people organizing together ought to derive particulars of an agenda. Um, there are people like Kina Shamsi of the ACLU, Maya Berry of the Arab American Institute. You know, there, there are lots of people who have looked at this in, in real programmatic ways and talk about like repeal the 2001 AUMF, I would not necessarily advocate stopping there, but, you know, repealing Section 702 of FISA and returning to FISA as the exclusive means for conducting national security uh, surveillance on U.S. persons or within the United States, the not only closure of Guantanamo Bay, but the, I don't know, write some law that in some way will end the possibility of indefinite detention without charge, even in law and, you know, of, of law of war constraint of of some sort, blah, blah, blah. I don't honestly know um, all the particulars. What I'm trying to get at is like, I viewed my role here not as either a wonk or a policymaker, but more someone to raise the challenge of abolition and make that an essential part of the story of the war on terror, because it has never been taken seriously. It has never gotten respectability from circles like the one circles like frankly lawfare lawfare you know more typically sneers at people who would say such things and not even take a full abolitionist approach and instead i want you know forgive the comparison it is definitely one that i will i'm sure immediately cringe at and i don't want it to be an offensive one i think you know his contexts are entirely different from mine but nevertheless like i heard a lot of criticism after ta Coates published The Case for Reparations, that ta didn't have like a 10-point plan for reparations. What he had was an advocacy of saying, let's take this seriously. And like, you know, John Conyers keeps introducing a bill to study what that would look like. I'd be happy with that. I think that this is a problem for America to come together and solve. And, you know, having an itemized bullet point list, I think kind of is not the point. I think that is the way that technocratic circles um, would look at it and they would look at it to find objections on the merits to any individual suggestion as a way of discrediting the broader enterprise. So it seems to me that this broad coalition and this bubbling up democratic idea, it seems to me that the the weakness in your argument is the one I've been pressing. And that is that, I'll just say it bluntly, and I mean no disrespect, that you don't take the reality of threat seriously enough. And until it seems to me, and you've got a story, of, and it might be true, about after a transition, things will be better. But you don't take the reality of threat seriously enough. And you don't take the possibility seriously enough. And again, I don't know if it's true either, that these things you want to dismantle are actually succeeding in keeping us safe. So you say you want to abolish 702. What if it turned out, just accept the hypothetical, that 10 terrorist attacks on the United States in various ways were disrupted through 702 in the last five years. I don't know if that's true. It might be zero. It might be 20. You still want to abolish it? Yes. I want to abolish it because I believe in the prospect of human freedom. And that is not compatible with a security, with a surveillance apparatus licensed by 702. I also have learned as a reporter over the course of 20 years of the war on terror. And certainly, as you know, I was one of the reporters uh, that got the Snowden leaks. 
And I saw how the internal documentation of those leaks was not about stopping terror attacks. They were stopping opportunities that the security state presumed were associated with terror attacks far, far upstream um, to, I, sorry, that I, that I suppose is a bit of a pun. I apologize for it. It was not intentional. Of those attacks, and I've heard the forces within the NSA, within the security establishment, lie to me and my colleagues relentlessly about how frequently stuff would be blowing up if not for what we've already done. And then when actually forced to press on that, they don't talk about 702 preventing terrorist attacks. They talk about 702 preventing terrorist plots, terrorist opportunities, and so on and so forth. And especially, I remember very well how when I had to be on a call with powerful people in the security uh, world, I have to, I suppose, respect the fact that this was an off-record call, but uh, we were at The Guardian trying to give the administration and the intelligence agencies a chance to respond meaningfully to the first story of the Snowden documents that we ran, uh, which was about the domestic bulk collection of Americans' phone records. And hearing people on that call talk about how we would have blood on our hands if we published. I don't think I have blood on my hands. I don't think that such abolition will, in fact, endanger us. I think that there is always going to be an impulse toward the security state coming up with these justifications that you, you, you yourself talk about as hypotheticals uh, rather than manifesting themselves to attribute terrorist attacks that do occur to a uh, lack of government vigilance rather than downstream effects of American policies uh, that favor the maintenance of the security state. So look, you can say that that's not taking the matter seriously, seriously with a capital S, but I haven't seen the advocates of this thing take it seriously at all. I've seen them only demagogue it, and I've seen them be refuted when we do get our greatest moments of truth about what the war looks like. So I mean, I'm not going to argue with you about that. I agree that there that the intelligence community has in the past exaggerated sometimes a lot. I also believe, and you don't believe this, that they've done lots to intercept and disrupt and discourage threats in various ways, but I can't prove that. Let me ask you one final hypothetical that's drawn from your book, just to understand what abolitionism is. Mm -hmm. You talk about, this CIA analyst, Nada Bakos, in March of 2003, who was watching Abu Masab Zarqawi sort of develop in northern Iraq with Ansar al-Islam. And he was operating, as you say, a, a crude bioweapons lab. And the CIA recommended taking him out. And the Bush administration declined to. And the CIA an analyst said that the reason they declined to take him out was because that would lessen or take away the justification for the invasion of Iraq. But should they have taken him out on your view? Let's say that bioweapons lab is preparing a, a bioweapon for the United States. I just don't understand what your view is on a concrete threat. Let's imagine, I think it's not even much of an imagination. You seem to be critical of not taking the strike, and yet I don't think you think we should have taken the strike. So I'm not sure what you think about that. I, I think that the thing to do in extremist circumstances like that is, when at all possible, arrest people and try them. What I think is unacceptable is constructing and maintaining an entire apparatus of perpetual war and perpetual unfreedom because of the manifestations of certain, I mean, look, the bioweapons lab, mm, was that really real or was that the CIA like best estimate of this? I'll, I'll, ta I'll take them uh, despite, you know, the lessons of history you, you described um, at their it, word. You described it as a crude bioweapons lab. Okay, but like, okay, you know, leaving aside the questions of deliverability of right. such a thing to the United States from 7,000 miles away, in that circumstance, sure, arrest the guy, grab him, do what is necessary to bring him to trial, and don't transform and keep the United States transformed onto a perpetual war footing. I don't accept that the existence of real security threats is a justification uh, for the disfigurement of American institutions that protect actual people's freedom. What we mean by protecting national security is very often protecting 
a hegemonic prerogative rather than the safety of actual people. And the, the example of not taking the strike on Abu Musab Zarqawi demonstrates how fungible the commitments uh, to protecting people are when they come against commitments to that hegemony. And you might want to say that I'm somehow contradicting myself by, you know, being willing to entertain the prospect of arresting Abu Musab Zarqawi and putting him on trial and finding a way to resolve the circumstances that threaten the United States through mechanisms other than constructing the architecture of this war. But once again, I have to come back to, we did it your way. How well did it turn out? I don't mean you specifically, Jack. I mean, not my way. I don't mean you specifically, Jack. Um, I, I, I do mean the way that it played out has a tremendous amount of elite purchase. It has a tremendous amount of elite justification and will continue to. And I think if we want to talk about the burdens of continued prospective threats that come out of the war on terror, then it is those elites who have to answer this question. It is those elites who should be made to answer for why there is such persistent terrorism despite 20 years of your war on terror and what might that finally tell us about the value of the war on terror and its relationship to the generation of those threats and its relationship to the degradation of American democracy and its relationship to the lack of safety felt at home by vulnerable communities, particularly those who are besieged by the sort of terror that the war on terror is uninterested in. We are not looking at things like the El Paso murders as terrorism. We are not looking at the Tree of Life synagogue shooting as terror, the Mother Emanuel murders, white terrorism. It's the oldest, most violent, and uh, most enduring terror in American history. And there's no war on terror against that. That is left out of the war on terror. Now, I certainly don't believe there ought to be a war on terror against that. I believe that instead, these are symptoms of a sick political culture that can only be confronted politically. And that right now, what we are seeing, particularly after January 6th, is that we are securitizing a response to January 6th instead of launching a broad political challenge to discredit and keep from power the architects of January 6th, those who justify January 6th, and so on and so forth. The more that the response takes the form of reorienting aspects and tools of the war on terror, the easier it will be the next time there's a Trump-like figure in power to have those people say, all right, if that's how you want it, then summer of 2020 is just the beginning, fellas. Get ready for what this looks like when we use these tools against you. I certainly don't believe, to go back to one of the first points you made aptly in this conversation, that such a thing goes away inside an atmosphere of an abolition of the war on terror. I believe that it is rooted very deeply in American history, and that is what has to be confronted. The war on terror can only be an engine of those noxious forces. It isn't an alternative to it. Spencer, thanks for a great interview and congratulations on your book. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. The music is by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer this episode is Hamza Shittu. This episode was edited by Jen Pachahal. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thank you for listening. Hello, this is John Grills from Creepy. Want to see something scary? Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Brought to you by AMC Networks. Shudder is a premium streaming service that promises its members a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds. All uncut and commercial free. 
Discover films and series that cover the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door and one of my new favorite movies, Psycho Gorman. Available ad-free, on-demand, and through the platforms you're already on. Shudder. So good, it's scary. Sign up at Shudder.com. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.